I want to welcome everybody here to Breath of Life. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Pastor Tony. For those of you that are on live stream, maybe the first time you tuned into an Easter message, I pray that you in, uh, hear the word of God and let it penetrate into your soul. And if you want to touch base with this, hit like and someone will get back to you and pray with you. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand, please. Amen. Let's all stand. <clears throat> Resurrection Sunday. He's risen. You've heard the sisters and brothers coming up here talking about it, singing about it from different countries. Now we are going to celebrate it. We're going to hear the word. We're going to apply the word. And I believe when you leave this service, you're going to go out there and tell somebody about the resurrected Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Father, we're looking for a resurrection of somebody here, somebody watching me on live stream, in their lives. Maybe their lives is not what they panned out to be. And there's a lot of disappointments, a lot of failures, and, and, and they tried everything, and nothing seems to work. And they're at wit's end, Father. So we need a Holy Ghost encounter this morning. Not just tickle our ears and just to hear another Easter sermon We've done that many years ago. We want something that's relevant, something that's alive, something that penetrates our soul. So when we hear the message, it just pierces our heart. And then we can see the Father for who he really is. Hallelujah. If you agree, say amen. amen. You may be seated. I want to tell you a story before I begin. The title of my message was, this is the sixth and final week of the sermon series, Life, death, and resurrection. Next week, we're going to have a four-part series. So if you like what you see and like what you hear, you don't want to miss the next four weeks because guess what? We're going to show you how your life can be transformed into the image of Jesus. Sometimes we have stumbling blocks and we don't know how to get around them. Well, by learning how to transform your life, you are going to understand how that is going to happen. But let me tell you a story before I begin. In John chapter 20, don't turn there, I just because you know the story. Mary Magdalene, after Jesus the third day, she went to the sepulcher, and you got a picture of it right there. My wife and I went to Jerusalem three years ago, and that's where we stood, right there. And when we looked and said, guess what happened? Jesus wasn't there. There's many religions out there. If you go to Buddha, if you go to Hare Krishna, and if you go to any of the other religions, their bones are in the grave except one, and his name was Jesus. Amen. So Mary Magdalene, even while before it was light, she walked in the dark to get to the sepulcher. And the stone was rolled away. And she looked in and said, oh, somebody, what happened? And she ran back, scared. She ran back and got Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus was closest to, and he leaned his head on at the Last Supper. And they came, and when she told them the story, they went to the sepulcher where Jesus was, and they looked inside, and nothing was there except for one thing, a white napkin at the head of the table where Jesus laid, but he wasn't there. How did that happen, and why did John put that in the gospel? This is the reason. The custom of the Israelites was that when a master and a servant, and a master serving food, and he's sitting at the table, and he's eating, and when he's finished, he would take that napkin, wipe his beard, wipe his hands, and throw it away, and the servant would be peeking in and say, okay, it's time to clean up. But if the napkin was folded, still white, still untouched, what it meant was, Jesus says, it's not finished. 
Where are you this morning? Because if you believe in that napkin story I just told you, the work of Jesus Christ is not finished yet. You may be sitting here and say, I failed God so many times, why would he want me? Easy. He died on the cross for you. He knew you were going to sin. He knew you were going to have shortcomings. He knew you were going to fail. But it didn't matter. Why? Because the napkin is still folded. His job with you is not finished. We say, Pastor, how can I change? Easy. At the end of this message, what we Pentecostals do is we have an altar call. And what that means is it's symbolic of the altar of God. And you come up here and you raise your hands. And I'll lead people into salvation. What is salvation? Salvation is that when we die from this earthly reign, we will spend eternity in heaven forever and ever. You mean to tell me even though I've sinned? Yes. Why would he do that? Because he loves us. Amen? Amen. So this morning, I want you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. So what happens? Jesus rose from the dead. You see the empty sepulcher. Now what? What's going to happen to us here? 2,000 something years later. We'll turn to Ephesians. Paul had a Jesus encounter on the way to Damascus. And Jesus spoke to him. Put your screen on. TV's not on. It's down. Praise God it's down. I'll pull out my trusty. Amen. Bear with me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5 on your handout sheet. You got your handout sheet? Who doesn't have one of these? Please raise your hand. You follow along with me with this one. Okay. God quickens us. You see, when you become born again, and we'll tell you about that later on, when you become born again, God quickens your spirit. He quickens your soul. He quickens you so where you can now follow Jesus Christ for the very first time. If you've walked away, he'll quicken you to come back. Why? Because you've tried it your own way. You tried the worldly standards. You tried the, all the things that the world had to, uh, to ask for, and guess what? You're still looking. For that peace and tranquility. Because Jesus meant that you were not going to have that peace and tranquility by doing it on your own. And you're going to bump heads constantly until one day you surrender and say, Lord, not my way, but your way. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, and it says this. But God, who was rich in his mercy... I'm reading out of the King James. Rich in his mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, verse 5, even when we were dead in our sins, has quickened us together with Christ, and by his grace we are saved. Grace means something that we deserve, but we don't get it. If you've broken any one of those Ten Commandments since you were a little boy or girl, you're destined to damnation. So God's saying here, using Paul, I've quickened you that if you surrender to Jesus Christ, you won't suffer eternal death. Yes, the physical body will die, but our soul will live forever and ever. Can I get somebody to say amen? amen. So some of you, I don't recognize... You came here this morning. Maybe you didn't want to. You wanted to go to another church. But God quickened you. Somebody in this church grabbed a hold of you and says, you need to be here. Not so many words, but you came. And you probably told that person, I want something deeper. I don't want someone just to tickle my ears and give me a nice Easter sermon and then I go on my way and nothing else happens. No, you wanted something deeper so you can sink your teeth into. As Christians, we recognize that God's mercy, meaning this, we deserve punishment for our sins, but he holds it back because of his mercy. You deserve it, but... And you got away with it, and you're wondering, oh, I can do it again, I'm okay, nothing happened. 
And you do it again and again and again. And all of a sudden, the hammer comes down. And that's when we start to realize cancer, death, divorce, separation, no job, no home. Parents don't want you. Everything else just collapses around you. Why? God is allowing that to get your attention because you don't want to listen. So what does he do? He allows Satan to come and attack you. Why? Because the foundations of the world, he knew you. And you're not here by an accident. God wants to do something supernatural. But there's something you have to do. It's not a freebie. Salvation is free, but everything after that, you have to work towards. And I'll get to that later on. So what happened? Christ rose from the dead. He says to his disciples, I go and I'm going to send you a comforter. What is a comforter? The Holy Spirit. So when we have tough times, and many Christians here have tough times, but we know we go to the cross and say, Jesus, I'm struggling right now, and I don't know why. And then the Holy Spirit reveals, is there any sin in you? And if there's no sin, then Lord, what are you trying to tell me? But if you are a sinner, then that's called judgment. That's upon your life. And it doesn't change because you come to church. It doesn't change because you give an offering. It doesn't change because you say, I believe in God. Satan believes in God too, but he ain't going to heaven. As Christians, we believe in the resurrected Christ. And all of a sudden, the Bible says he changes us and he describes it this way. In a twinkling of an eye. It changed. But I don't feel nothing. We Christians know we don't go by feelings. Feelings can misguide you. We go by the promises of his word. Amen. And a twinkling of an eye, when you come and ask God into your heart, it happens right there. And your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. So when you get up there, they're not going to say, where are your sins? Because you're covered in the blood of Jesus. That's what he shed on that day. That blood spilled onto the dirt. So now what happens? We're changed. You start to raise up. You start to sin less. Because there's a transformation. You're so used to living in the world and the worldly standards. It's hard to break away. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit. And you can't get the Holy Spirit on your own. You need to come and understand what is the power of the Holy Spirit and how is it transferred to us. Look at your handout, 1A. You see, our hearts, at one time, if you're a believer, our hearts felt the sentence of death. If you're sitting here this morning or you're watching me right now on live stream, you are sentencing and witnessing the sentence of death in your life. So what do you try to do? You try to cover it up. You go to TikTok, you go to Facebook, you go to Twitter, and you put out those silly things out there hoping to distract the people to know that you're lost. And you're hoping that somebody agree with you to make you feel good. Christian doesn't matter if we feel good. We just know where we're heading. And whatever the Lord wants to do to us, we're not our own. We're his. Can I get an amen? amen. So turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 9 and 10. Amen. amen. Say amen when you got it. Amen. It says this. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which is raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doeth delivered us in whom we trust, and he will yet deliver us. NIV says it a little bit differently. Let me read the NIV version. NIV says it this way. Indeed, we felt 
we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead and delivers us. So if you're sitting here today and you're contemplating becoming a Christian and you're wondering why you're sitting here, now you know. You've been thinking about it. You don't want that sentence of death in your life. You see what's the roadblock Satan is putting in your life. He's not going to let up. We're getting into the end times. He's going to make it harder and harder and harder. And the only way out is Jesus. Amen. Amen. However, there are some people here this morning, here and also on live stream, that are dead. Not physically dead, but they're dead spiritually. They hear these words and it doesn't move them whatsoever. Dead in their trespasses. Dead in their sins. Having no real life. But God sent his Holy Spirit that if we just, two things, believe and receive him, he can wipe out your whole lifestyle and make you a child of God. Man. Question, why do people struggle with that? Why don't they just surrender their life? You know why? It's because they don't want to give up their secret sin. Ah, ah, getting quiet here, huh? Yes, they know what sins there are. And so what happens? Jesus says, I won't leave you comfortless. If you come to me and surrender your life to me, I'll take care of you. I'll nurture you. I'll supply all your needs. All you have to do is just come to me. He's going to raise us this morning. Somebody here is going to be raised up out of your deadness. You've been thinking about it. You've been contemplating it. But you really haven't taken a step forward. And Jesus says when somebody makes a decision in public, they are serious about that choice. Look at number two on your screen. He gives us resurrected power. You see, when you're a Christian... There's power in your words. I've had people that are not saved try to invite someone to church and they don't come. They say, Pastor, how come? Because you haven't got the power. You need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And that doesn't come because you come to church. It comes when you ask the Holy Spirit to come in and show you the way. I wonder how many here are beyond that power. They're despairing their lifestyle. They're looking at their lifestyle. Maybe they're reaching that age of 40, and all of a sudden, the plans they had for their life are not working out. The husband or wife that you lay with uh, is, not, uh, is not the one, and you're, and you're contemplating what's going on. See, that's a lie from the devil. He's trying to discourage us from our choices. God takes us just the way we are. We don't have to be something supernatural. All we have to do is come to the cross, open up our hands and say, Lord, come into my life and give me this resurrected power. Amen. You mean he would do that? Yes. Why? Because he loves us. Amen. How does it happen? Easy. Someone like me comes and preaches the gospel. Or you go out in the street and the evangelist out there telling people about Jesus. Somebody in this church is raised up to be an evangelist, goes to the jails, goes to the hospitals, go visit elderly, and tells them about Jesus. That's the resurrection power. Amen. Because now when you go out there and you speak, lives are changing. Drug addicts, alcoholics, don't do it no more. Why? They got the resurrected power. Amen. I don't know how you got here this morning. I... Try to meet some of the people here, and uh, I was rushed for time, but you came for a good reason. Don't let it slip by at the end of this message. If this message was for you, you come. Someone around you, maybe someone, a brother, a husband, a wife, have been delivered from their sins. They don't do drugs. They don't join the gangs no more. They're out of prison and they don't want to go back. That's resurrection power. And they're showing you this can happen for you. 
God's not a respecter of persons. If you surrender your life, that means totally. You can't be dipping into the cookie jar, so to say. Amen? Well, I'll get spiritual today and pick out that nice cookie. But then tomorrow, I'm going to go back into the world. It doesn't work, saints. It doesn't work. See, I'm on a life and death mission at Breath of Life. You saw the praise and worship coming up here. It's an international church. All colors, all races, all denominations, they're coming here and they worship Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. 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 Maybe, look at number 2a. Ephesians chapter 2. We are alive in Christ. Alive! How many of you, you wake up in the morning and you say, oh man, I gotta go to work. What a bummer. That boss is one pain in the, you know what? I don't like my boss. I don't like my job. I don't even like my husband. Ouch. And he's saying this in Ephesians. We're alive in Christ. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 again. This is on the NIV. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. It's up. Oh, praise God. Chapter 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You're sitting here today. You may even be a Christian, but you're still dead in your sins because you haven't totally surrendered your heart. God doesn't want lip service. God doesn't want just Sunday attendance. He wants to remove all the stain of sin. That's what holds us back. And when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit that comes on you, you're alive. And look what he says. As for you, never dead in your transgressions. Next one. Verse 2. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world, of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Who's the kingdom of the air? Satan, he's the one that's causing all this chaos in this world. It's not God. God is holy. He's pure. He can't do these things. But God is allowing this because of the sin of the world. And he's trying to gather up people to say, you know what? It ain't getting any better, folks. You better come and get alive with me. Amen. He says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Some of you have been to church. Some of you have heard the gospel, yet you still are defiant. You're still stubborn to say, I'm not surrendering. Why? Because you want that secret sin. You want God to bless you first, and then you'll surrender. Folks, he's not a sugar daddy. It don't work that way. When I was a drug addict, I had to lay it down. I said, Lord, I can't lay it down because I love it so. But I was truthful to God. And he looked into my heart. And then he transformed my thinking and my heart into the image of Christ. Went to Bible school. Started to learn more. Why? So when the enemy tries to come and deceive me, I'm ready for him. Think about it. Imagine someone kicking your door open. Men, what would you do? Oh, the, the refrigerator's over there and the, uh, the TV's over there and, the, and, and this money's over there. No, you wouldn't. You would defend your home. Well, that's what Jesus does. You see, you can't defend your home because the devil is too sly. I know. He tricked me three times and I fell. Why? Because I was leaning on Tony. Instead of leaning on the cross, which is Jesus Christ. Amen? Resurrected power. Praise God. It's about getting a new life. 2A. Getting a new life. It's not about religion. I had people walk in and say, yeah, I, I heard about this religious church. You can turn around this morning and say, here at Breath of Life, pastor denounces religion. We speak about Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. Religion is man-made. A whole bunch of do's and don'ts. I'm not here to tell you you're a sinner. That's not my job. 
My job is to give you the gospel, and then when you're connected and you're alive in Christ, all of a sudden, he starts to speak to you. We look around, we see people making money, successful business, and they don't seem to have any problems in their lives. Everything is good. And you know what they tell me? Is that all there is? Is that all there is, making money, having a home, having your children go to college? Is that it? No. God wants to plant his seed inside of us. He didn't save you just so you can be a pew potato. No, he saved you so you can go out there and speak to your family members, to pray for them, to encourage them. You see their lives, and they're messed up. And you're not judging them. It's obvious. They don't have any love in their heart for anything but themselves. But when we get a hold of Jesus, that all changes. Now it's no longer about ourselves. It's about everybody else. Because God says, I'll take care of your needs. Don't worry about that. I'll supply it. Number three. God wants to raise up somebody here today. Maybe you've heard my sermons before or watched them on television. And you want to make a decision. Jesus is looking for you. Called you out by name. Counted all your hair on your head. You didn't choose him. You Christians sitting here, you didn't choose God. He chose you. Why? Why did he chose you? You might have been the, 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 the worst kid in your family. But he chose you. Why? Because now when they start to see a change in your demeanor, they see the joy of the Lord flooding your soul. And then you tell them about the love of Christ. They can't deny it. They can say, I don't believe in God. But they can't say, I don't believe in you. Because I've seen the change in you. Because God has got a hold of you. You become alive. You're being transformed. It's not going to happen overnight. It can take a lifetime. God Look, turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Am I making sense, folks? Amen. Am I making sense? Amen. Okay. If you're sitting here and you disagree, you're not disagreeing against pastor. You're disagreeing against God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18 to 22. And I'm reading out of the King James again. Is it there? Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Next verse. Who being past feelings have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. 20. But you have not learned Christ. 21. If so, be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversations of the old man, which is corrupt according to the seaful lust. What he's telling you simply is this. You have to look inside your soul. I can't do that. My job is just to present the gospel. It's the Holy Spirit's job to put his finger on your heart. And some of you right now are starting to feel the conviction. That conviction is it's starting to hit home and make sense. All the things you thought were worth, worthly, worldly don't matter no more. Why? Because it leads to death and destruction. Can't take it with you, folks. Today is a special day. Time is getting short. Look what's happening all around the world. <coughs> Storms, earthquakes. I just found out Alaska. Every year, 15% of the ice caps are melting. And what does that do? It raises the, te it lowers the temperature of the water, and that's how you get global warming. And the seas start to rise. 
And that's why you see flooding and hurricanes and tornadoes. It's the signs of the times. We haven't got time to waste. We haven't got time to dilly-dally. We have to first acknowledge you're a sinner. You've broken every one of his laws. And you need a savior. You see, today it won't matter if you don't acknowledge you're a sinner. It won't matter. I can speak till kingdom come and it won't change. Unless you say, Holy Spirit, I want to change, but I just don't know how. When you do, and you make that first step, something happens. There's a hunger and a thirst for more of Jesus. You can't wait to get here. Why? Because something inside you is being transformed. You're alive now. You're no longer dead in your sins and trespasses of uh, rebellion, doing it your way. There are a lot of Christians are doing it their way, and they'll be the first ones going to hell. Why? Because God never told them to do what they're supposed to do. He said, submit yourself to the local congregation, and God will use your gifts to go out there and win souls. Can I get an amen? amen. Right now, if you feel a tugging on the inside of your heart, it's not me. It's not my convicting message. It's the Holy Spirit. Don't turn there, but Luke 9 says, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes to glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. It's giving us a warning. Don't be ashamed of this gospel. It's going to transform you. Go to 1 John. Look at 3a. If we confess He's faithful to forgive us. 1 John. Hallelujah. 1 John chapter 9. Is it there? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all. You know, some of you know my story, but I have a lot of new people here. I was facing 10 years in prison. For drug, possession, and use. It's faithful to forgive us. He forgave me 37 years ago. And I haven't turned my back on Jesus. Because he took me out of that miry clay. He took me out of the business world of making money. Because that was my God. I could, there was one type of money. Never enough. So that's what I worshipped. And when I came to church and got saved, I still had that stigma about giving. Why? Well, churches just use your money so they can buy this and buy that. It's none of the, your business what they do. It's you're giving it to God, not to man. Man will fail you. I will fail you. But God will never fail you. Somebody give me an amen. amen. So if you want to give your life to Jesus this morning, I'm going to invite you right now to come. I'm not going to scream at you, even though I'm good at that. All right? It's a quiet calling. I'm going to woo you. That's what Jesus does. He woos us to the altar to say, son, daughter, I selected you. I told that person to bring you for this appointed time. And all I'm asking is to raise your hands and say, Lord, come into my life. And show me the way. That's all you have to. You don't have to take away those sins. God forgives you. Amen. Do I have to change? It's the Holy Spirit that prompts you to change. I can't force anybody to change. I'm not God. But the Holy Spirit will do that. You see, you came here because you wanted some meaning for God. Not just to... Filled a void in your life. You wanted something real. That's why you keep coming back. You wanted to meet God. You wanted to have a relationship. That's why we open up our doors at 1015. Not so you can pop in at 11 o'clock. We need the fellowship of the brethren. We need each other. It's not just hearing my message. It's about having a cup of coffee or the kids having a cup of milk. And a donut or a piece of fruit. 
and we talk about what life is doing in us. And then we pray for each other. And we lift each other up. That's church. Amen. Prayer means nothing if your heart's not in it. I've heard people pray. And they go right out there sinning. Listen. I'm going to close with this. Right now, if you're serious... God wants to open your heart. But pastor, I've been in this church many a time. Yeah, but you never opened your heart. You opened your mind, but God's not concerned with your mind. He's concerned with your heart. Because that's where the change takes place. Secondly, God right now is standing at the door of your heart. He says, son, daughter, I'm looking for you. You can't escape. Oh, you can leave this place. And not come to the altar, not get saved. But guess what? You can never tell Jesus on Judgment Day, no one ever warned you about being transformed and living for Christ. He takes that away today. He said, Pastor, you're frightening me. No, I'm not. I'm giving you an invitation to come and experience life. And all you do is confess with your mouth. You don't confess to me. I can't forgive sins. Though there's denominations out there where you confess with man, not here. <laughs> where does that say that in the Bible? It doesn't. You confess to God. Listen, look at your sheet. Come with all your sins and confess. Lay them out. You don't have to do it audibly. You can do it in your, in your heart and your mind. Say, Lord, you know my sins. You know my life. They're so... The, the list is so long, I don't know where to begin. But see, God is looking for the intent of your heart. Where's your heart this morning? We got the resurrected Jesus who's given us the way. The Bible says the truth and the way. No one gets to the Father unless it's through Jesus. Amen. Amen? Amen. And then lastly, he asks you, would you give the Holy Spirit a chance? Because you can't do it. In your own thinking, you can't surrender to God unless the Holy Spirit prompts us to surrendering. Because when you do that, he puts a shield around you that no devil can touch you. You may be harassed because the people that get saved, as soon as they leave, the devil is all, already on them. Trying to convince them it's a sham. But it's not. Look around we got Christians that their lives. we got gangsters here. we got drug addicts here. People have sinned and their lives are being transformed. It can happen to you. Well, Pastor, I never did drugs and alcohol. Good. But how many of the Ten Commandments have you broken? Ah. You're guilty. And there's no way out. Holy Spirit, I want you to stand right now. And I'm going to pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Next week, we're going to have a transformed life message. I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit, for those, twofold question. One, if you're backslidden, that means you've turned your back on God and you haven't been faithful. But you want to make a recommitment. That's the beauty about God. I don't know how many times I failed him. And I would come to church and I'd sit way in the back. And I had my ragged clothes because I was, I was doing drugs the night before. And I was ashamed because I knew better. And then the pastor made an invitation. He says, come, all you that are heavy laden. Meaning this, you got a whole bunch of sin on you and you can't get it off of you. Come to the altar. And the Holy Spirit is going to wipe it away. Secondly, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is the time. Make a commitment to say, Lord, I just don't want to be a, an Easter visitor. I want it to be every day of my life. Would you raise your hands with me right now? I'm going to pray. And at the end of this prayer, I want you, if you're A, backslidden, B, you don't know Jesus. And guess what? Our church does not condemn anybody. 
Because by the grace of God, so go they. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that the Holy Spirit, you've given us the tools right now. We're transformed. The Spirit is here. All we have to do is receive it. You're going to transform us. You're going to change our lives from within. And all we have to do is surrender to you, Lord. That's why you're here. That's why you came to give us a changed lifestyle. So now we have direction, not from the pastor, not from the church, but from you, Lord. So, Lord, anybody sitting here, standing here right now, anybody watching me right now, if you feel that tugging in your heart and you want Jesus to make it right or you want to make a recommitment, I want you to come forward right here and we'll pray for you. It's a simple prayer. We're not going to bang you over the head with something. No, we're just going to pray for you and love you. Amen? As the music plays.